Thank you so much, choir. This morning, I wanted to know, in honor of back to school, uh, who your favorite teacher was. Does anybody remember the name of a favorite teacher? Mom? Mr. Short. Jerry? Thornhill? Marvin? Princess Martin? OK, great. <laughs> Bob, do you have one? Miss Price? You're not going to say Nancy? <laughs> Ouch, you wounded. Uh, for those who don't know, Bob was in Nancy's uh, class. Uh, any other, oh shit, you guys are over here today. Any favorite teachers back? Trish Andy? John Hollis. John Hollis. James, Farmer. James Farmer. Ms. Melvick? Julian Reed, cheater. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, why was this person your favorite teacher? Was it a feeling? Was it something they taught you? Think in your head. This I don't want someone to take over, so I'm not going to let you tell me. That could be for lunchtime. Um, I can remember I had an AP history teacher that I really loved. I even toured the college he went to because I liked him so much because he taught concepts, not dates. And my brain doesn't hold dates. So I was doomed in any history class that wanted me to know what date something happened. He wanted us to know the flow of history and what impacted each other. I also had a sixth grade language arts teacher, for those of us who remember, uh, which is probably most of us, those projector screens where you put the transparency on. Um, all the kids are gone, so I know we're fine. Um, she would draw with colored transparency markers and then spray it with water so that it meshed together when she felt like the class was getting too restless or too crazy or anything. It was just like a mellow brain break that she would do. I had a ninth grade government teacher uh, that we could distract from the lesson at the drop of a hat. I did not learn a lot of government in ninth grade because we could mention something random and she would go off on a tangent and it was lovely. Um, but I also remember my least favorite teacher. I'm sure some of you can as well. Uh, and my least favorite teacher was my AP Psych senior teacher uh, because half the class you sat there quietly and took notes and the other class he did a verbal pop quiz on what you had just taken notes on. And so not only was class really boring, but he was also kind of dismissive about the subject matter and mental health in general, which I thought was a weird pairing. But as some of our teachers know, you don't always get to pick what you teach within your subject matter. And so I just didn't really enjoy that class at all. And so as I was thinking today about my favorite and least favorite teachers, I had a hard time coming up with specifics, like, oh, this is what they did, and it made me hate them forever. Hate's a strong word, I know that. Um, but what I remembered is I would think, I would picture that uh, sixth grade teacher. We were in a, a portable at the time, and the feeling that we had in her class bubbled up. Positive or negative, I would understand that I liked that teacher because of that feeling. And so as I was going through this activity of my own life, I was struck by a quote that Rev. Deb shared at Rose Blatch's memorial service last Saturday from Maya Angelou. And it goes like this. It says, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. People forget specifics, but they remember emotions and they remember feelings. Our hymn for today as we finish up our hymn series goes like this. It says, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. This is what we are immersed in today, but also in our whole lives, that people will know we are Christians based on how we make them feel. Not necessarily about what we tell them, but how we make them feel. I know over the years I have shared with you a lot about how I do children and youth ministry. If you remember, that's how I started here. I came from First Garland as their children and youth minister here as y'all's children and youth minister, and then slowly climbed up the ladder. And 
This is what I remind myself when I feel like an event isn't going well or I'm struggling to figure something out or especially at the end when I think something has flopped. I go through a checklist. I say, were the kids safe? Did they feel loved by at least me and one other adult? And were they fed? The answer to those three things tell me if something was successful or not. And that last one, where they fed, can mean spiritually or actually physically because you can't concentrate on an empty stomach. And Jesus walks around feeding people all the time. Basically, every other story is either Jesus praying or Jesus eating dinner with someone. So it must be important because he does it so often. I know some of you are a little nervous that my philosophy and theology of children's ministry didn't include a list of stories or theological practices that I wanted them to walk away knowing, and that's because those things naturally follow. When those first three things are taken care of, the other things happen naturally. When kids feel safe and loved in our presence, they feel safe and loved in the presence of God. And then they want to get to know God better. They want to get to know the stories that you are teaching better because they are safe and loved. If they do not feel those things, if, think, if learning about God is a chore, if they feel judged or unwelcome, they will also attribute those feelings to God and not want that relationship. Some of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's one of those educational bedrock theories. And if you look at it like either a triangle or a ladder, it tells you you can't move up unless the bottom is complete. And what's on the bottom is food, water, and safety. If those three things aren't met, you can't move up. You can't learn anything else. You can't learn anything at all if those three things aren't met. We know it from our own lives that when our bellies are grumbling, that's all we think about. That's all we hear. We cannot learn. We cannot process if food, water, and safety are not met. And so while it's my philosophy for children's ministry, it's also my philosophy for adult ministry. You see a lot of times in young adult ministry that they do it around a table because, number one, how do you get college kids to show up to things? Because you feed them because they're poor. And number two, when their bellies are full, their minds and hearts are full as well. And so we hear from Scripture, a new command I give you, love one another. There's a period there. It's not love one another, but, or love one another and. Just love one another, period. Love one another. And that's what our hymn, our very simple hymn is based on. Love one another so that others may know you, know Christ, and know God. Our hymn for today was written in the 60s by a Catholic priest, and it was designed to be easy to sing. Some of you, when I mentioned it, probably started singing it in your heads. I think there are a fair number who may not need to even open their hymnals when we sing it in a minute. But it was written as a true teaching hymn, a simple theological hymn that anyone could find accessible. The author wrote it at a time when the world was in upheaval and it was designed to be sung at interfaith and interracial events because if you think about the 60s and all of the things that happened there, we have the civil rights, we have Vietnam, the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, just to name a few of the things that happened around the writing of this hymn, it felt like the world was on fire, which I think is something we can resonate with today. Sometimes it feels like our world has been on fire since 2020 when everything shut down for a little bit. And so this hymn was designed to ground people, to remind them who they are called to be and the feeling they are to help foster in the world. Very simply, it tells us that they will know we are Christians by our love. We will walk hand in hand spreading God's love. We will work with each other to guard each one's dignity and pride. And in all things, we will praise God while we do it. I've asked it before, but do people know you are a Christian? And if they do, do they know you're a Christian because they, you tell them 
you are a Christian or because you act like it and you live it out? Do people feel safe and welcome and loved and respected in your presence? Do they feel God's love shining through you in your actions? I know we've all been in the presence of people who don't do this, who say one thing but then do another. You know, someone who says, oh, I don't like being the center of attention, but somehow they're always in the middle of things. Someone who says, oh, I don't love gossip, but every time you turn around, they're sharing a tidbit about someone else's life. Or that person who, when they're driving, never uses their own signal and then yells at the other cars for not using their turn signal. I'm sorry if I'm calling anybody out right now. Um, (laughs) Or those who say, well, I never fail. I've never messed up in my life, but judge harshly anyone else who even slips up a little bit. We all know these people, and they might be descriptions of our own selves, but what we should be doing is working every day to not be those people, to live a life that matches what we tell people, to live a life so people know we are Christians by our love. Every action that we do telegraphs something about ourselves. One of the podcasts I listen to when um, occasionally talking about how people dress, and especially school dress codes and things like that, say that our clothing communicates. It communicates who we are, what we're showing up to do, what kind of respect we want. Our actions communicate who we are, who we love, who we follow, who we want others to know about us. Everything we do says something. And that doesn't mean you have to be perfect because none of us are, right? But when we do mess up, when we do falter, we should acknowledge it. We should say, I messed up in this moment. Because that's a teaching moment as well, offering forgiveness to others, but also ourselves, doing repentance and repair work to others, but also ourselves, shows that we are Christians because Jesus never walks away from us. Jesus never says, you've messed up too much, I give up on you. That love that Jesus offers us is always there, and so we should be offering that love to others and to ourselves. Sometimes that's the hard part, isn't it? Loving ourselves. The world should know that we are Christians by our love. By our love. Let us give thanks and praise, and pray together. Holy God, we know we are not perfect. We are not always a shining example of the love that you would have us share, but we're trying, Lord. We're trying each and every day to follow in your footsteps, to radiate love for the world. Give us strength and hope to try. In your name we pray. Amen. If you are committed to trying harder every day, to seeking God's love and sharing God's love with the world, and you want to do that either by saying yes to God's love for the first time or joining East Dallas Christian Church as either an associate member or a full member, I invite you to come forward with me as we all stand and sing hymn 494.